So thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the lessons that we learned from a project where we surveyed throughout Texas and worked on revising the conservation status ranks of all Texas land snails. And uh, as Ross mentioned, this project was done with Benjamin Hutchins and Jeffrey Nicola. Uh, so as he said, this was funded by a st state wildlife grant. And we also had a great deal of support from University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, the biology department, our College of Sciences, uh, high school students that were involved with the project, tons of field help, and many people at museum collections and also who oversee natural areas helped us with access to land. Um, much of this project was done on state or federal lands uh, so that we had access to the particular sites that we wanted to survey. So we really appreciate everyone's help with our work. Okay, so what I'm going to, uh, this is sort of the outline of our talk today. So what I wanted to do was talk about some broad patterns of land snail diversity, things that we see across land snails, and then how that applies to Texas land snails. Then I'll tell you about this land snail re-conservation ranking project and how we went about it. And then what we learned, a few things about some interesting Texas land snails, and also what we learned more broadly about how you go about doing a big project like this across a large landscape in a, a relatively poorly known group of organisms. Okay, so just to, to tell you a little bit about land and freshwater snails. So here I'm talking about snails, uh, terrestrial or land snails that live their entire lifespan on, on dry land. And then freshwater snails, which would be ones that are just in uh, freshwater creeks, springs, or aquifer water. These are some of the most imperiled organisms globally, and they have the highest number of documented extinctions of any faunal group. Uh, so these, this graph shows you um, nature serve conservation status ranks. And so those are, uh, so for example, the G1 ranking is critically imperiled. That's the highest level of imperilment for a group of organisms. Imperiled would be G2. Those two categories together are considered in their own unique category by most states as their species of greatest conservation need. And those are usually tracked by state agencies to assist with their conservation and be aware of any potential changes or declines in their status. You can then go on up in the rankings, including vulnerable, and then on up to stable. And then there's a category for extinct or presumed extinct. And in the top two groups are land snails and then freshwater mussels. And so about um, over 50% of both land and freshwater snails are considered imperiled or already extinct. Now, so a highly imperiled group, but also one that we don't know as well as we should. Uh, so in a um, estimate of land snail diversity from a few years back now, uh, we looked at the rate of species descriptions over time and the amount of the globe that had been well uh, described. And what we found is that probably most species of terrestrial and freshwater mollusks have yet to be described. So there's a little over 25, around 25,000 uh, terrestrial mollusks have been described, and maybe as much as double or triple that actually exists. So um, there's still a lot to learn about this group but that we're losing at a rapid pace. Now, just as an example of where we can see this in Texas, uh, in a survey of uh, residential yards in the lower Rio Grande Valley, the students in my invertebrate zoology class found 95% of people's front yards had this snail there, Praticolella mexicana, the Mexican scrub snail. But this snail was only described in 2011. So we didn't actually know that this was a distinct species until just in the last 10 years or so. So even things that are literally in every front yard, every person in the Rio Grande Valley sees these on their driveway, wasn't really described until just the last 10 years. So there's still a lot to learn about our Texas snails. But we do know some things. So let me tell you a, a couple of broad patterns of snail diversity. This is from an, an overview paper by Jeff Nicola, and I'm just going to pull a couple of those patterns where we can highlight some things about the Texas fauna. So one thing you might not know if you don't already haven't already spent a lot of time looking at snails is that snail faunas are mostly tiny. Um, so the average snail that you run across in Texas, three out of every four snails that we looked at in the course of our work uh, is smaller than Lincoln's nose on a penny or about the same size. So here's a, a scattering of the size and scale of some Texas land snails. Um, so half the fauna of Texas, uh, of the about 200 or so species in Texas are less than 10 millimeters. So they tend to be small, which might 
make you think that these uh, realize that these small unobtrusive things might get less attention than the big, like the very large snails that are greater than 40 millimeters. So for example, here's one that we'll talk about a little bit to, throughout today, Gastrocopta pellucida, the slim snaggle tooth. Three out of every four snails that we looked at in Texas from Texas were belong to this species. So these tiny things are really numerically dominant and also the most common species. Some of the places where you would expect to find the most snails are places with bedrock outcrops, places like rocky woodlands with exposed rock, especially limestone, um, where you have uh, an aspect that's shaded from the sun. So a place like this, a uh, little drainage with exposed bedrock and lots of leaf litter, that's going to be perfect for harboring lots of snails. Another place you might not think of immediately, but wooded wetlands, especially if they're relatively calcareous soil, also harbor very rich snail communities. And we use this sort of background information about snail diversity to you to target some of the survey work that we did for, for Texas snails. Okay, so now I've told you that most land snails are very tiny. Um, something that sort of comes out of that is that you can find lots of species at a very small spatial scale. And so this is data from a study of limestone cliffs. And what was found is in a survey area that's literally like this, 400 centimeters square, you can find 21 different species of land snail in an area one meter square you can find 23 or on just one site you know you sort of match out a patch of cliff and say all right i'm gonna look all around here you might find up to 30 34. and so what that means for surveying is i can go to one really good cliff site exposed bedrock limestone lots of nice shade and i can collect a ziploc gal you know a quart size ziploc bag full of leaf litter and end up with 10,000 snails in that sample up to 21 species and so you can see how quickly we could make ourselves a lot of work to to process but the way that plays out for texas land snails um, when we did some of our survey work, I just wanted to give you a taste of where some of the places are that have the highest diversity in Texas. <clears throat> so this table shows uh, the total number of samples we took on the far right in a couple of different habitats. Central Texas, Trans-Pecos at the low elevation and the high elevation, and then South Texas and Piney Woods. The first column shows you the average number of species per site. And so this, the region of Texas with the highest average number of species per site was Central Texas. Um, but then the ne next column shows you the range, the number of species that we found in samples. So some sites in Central Texas had four, and then one really spectacular site had 20. This, the places in Texas that had the absolute maximum diversity at one site were in the mountains, coniferous montane forests in the Trans-Pecos in the mountains, and then one really awesome site in the Piney Woods that had 24 species. So the average diversity was highest in Central Texas, and then the absolute highest were some spots in the Trans-Pecos and the Piney Woods. Okay, so now let's switch over to from broad patterns of diversity to exactly what we were trying to accomplish with our uh, survey project. And so just to revisit those conservation status ranks, um, I told you that uh, we, we looked at categories like considering a species critically imperiled, imperiled, all the way up to secure. Those first two categories, uh, critically imperiled and imperiled, are considered in one bundle, the species of greatest conservation need, and then tracked by state um, wildlife agencies. The ranking uh, the way that you go about ranking these, there's a couple of different methods for doing it. We use the one that's shared across the kind of United States um, agent, wildlife agencies. You can also use the one for the International Union or the ones for Canada, but we use the one for the U.S. Now, these conservation status ranks are important. They carry a lot of weight depending on the state. What they're used for is to prioritize funding for conservation and research actions for conservation. So to guide the conservation effort for any particular group of organisms. These conservation status ranks were first added, uh, estimated for Texas snails when land snails were added to the Texas Wildlife Action Plan in 2005. These rankings and normally initial rankings come from literature review and expert opinions. Now, one thing that we observed when we were looking at the species, a list of species of greatest conservation concern for Texas, is there were some curious omissions from that list. 
uh, we noticed that there's a few things that we thought of as really, really rare, like we never saw them that weren't on the list. And then there's some things that were on the list that we found all the time in the right habitat. And so it seemed like the list wasn't quite reflecting real uh, conservation need. And then another major source of bias that we observed, uh, if you recall earlier, I told you that half of Texas land snails are below 10 millimeters in size. Well, 36% of those are less than five millimeters. So minute snails, this size snails, but none of them are on, were on the SGCN list. So clearly there was some source of bias, perhaps in terms of observation and consideration of the very smallest snails, which are half the fauna. And so we realized that we really don't, didn't have much really comparable empirical data on the land snail fauna of most of Texas. It seemed like the fauna list and the conservation rankings were really driven by the large, relatively charismatic snails where you can go out and if you find a good spot with these tree snails, Rhabdotus, you could collect 200 shells in just a few minutes. And that's what we apparently these lists were based on. So what we knew before we started the project, there was 254 land snail, report, land snail species reported from Texas and 30 species on that SGCN list and about 15 were known to be introduced to the state. Okay, so the task in front of us was how do we best go about building an evidence base for efficient, effective conservation of Texas land snails that really accurately captures their true conservation threat? Um, and this really applies to any large landscape and poorly known group of organisms. We know we have about 200, 250 snails to, to look at and a huge landscape to cover. And so um, we wanted to come up with a strategy and also evaluate what are the best aspects of that strategy for coming up with that evidence base. And so we started out by looking at the literature. So what people had reported they found before. We visited museum collections. This is the UT El Paso Museum collection and the Perot Museum, which is formerly the Dallas Museum of Natural History. And those are um, unique, actually, among North American museums because they've had a they had long term land snail focused curators, which most museums don't. So they're actually really reflect the, the best source of evidence about Texas land snails. And the other thing that we can do is do some new field work. What we wanted to do was try and use a strategic approach uh, and use the Texas Ecosystem Analytical Mapping Program, which you can see shown here, and I'll show you the link in a moment. Um, but essentially, this they've mapped the entire state of Texas, and you can select the different vegetative categories that you want to visit, and it will show you very fine-grained maps that map out a specific veg type of vegetation. So, for example, um, uh, like palm or uh, Texas deciduous thorn scrub or low depression wetlands or some type of vegetative habitat. And the other thing that we needed to do was for those 30 species of greatest conservation need, go and visit the sites where they were described from historically and confirm that they were still present. Last, we wanted to see which of those data sets is most useful, which actually gives us the best evidence. All right, so we started our project by going to visit those museum collections. Now, uh, one term you, you might not be familiar with is a lot. Um, we think a lot, but in a lot in museum jargon means a group of animals or plants that was collected at a certain time and place. And so those would all be held together in one little box. So for example, this is a lot of some polygyrid and all of those individuals came from the same time and place. So we sampled, for example, about 5,000, we re-identified about 5,000 museum lots. Each of those uh, lots could have 10,000 tiny snail shells in them. So just realize a lot is not just one snail, it's all the snails from that collection. And so what we did at the museum collections is quality control. So we took every museum sample and looked at every single snail in that sample. And usually the taxonomic expert uh, re-identified it. So Jeff led the tiny snails and I led the bigger snails. And then we had any close calls required two-person agreement. In the process, we did things like writing keys to genera, writing keys to the species, updating keys for things where um, organism, lists where organisms where um, things had been described since the last key was written. So we made ourselves sort of a, a set of materials for consistent identification. Now, what we found from the museum records was pretty troubling. So we re-identified all Texas snail lots from these two museums. And what we found, uh, this graph shows number of lots and then the various size classes. So minute on the left to large on the right. 
Um, everything in the bottom is correct with some fiddling. Everything in, in above means it couldn't be corrected unless you actually went and visited the collection. So when we get the museum's database, 42% of their uh, records in their database were wrong. Now, a big chunk of them could be fixed just by updating the names, like something had been clearly moved to a new genus, you could just kind of find and replace and, and fix the names. But 20% of those incorrect records, you actually had to go and visit the collection and look at every snail in, in, in each lot in order to re-identify them. One of the main sources of error that we found was uh, lots of these tiny snails where you'd have two or 10 different species all bundled together and called one thing. And those require a really good eye and practice to separate them. And so we found that if you just pull down a museum database record for snails without uh, going and looking at every one, 20% of your records are going to be wrong. And that misidentification rate varies across groups. So for example, the small snails, it was worse. They're harder to ID um, or less attention was paid to them. And it's also worse in families that are very species rich. So we think probably that in groups where you have a whole bunch of closely related species in a region, they're harder to tell apart than things that are in different families. So families that are diverse and smaller tended to have even higher misidentification rates. And this was a major source of error in the list of, of what occurs in the state. Next, we went to the taxonomic literature. Um, most kind of survey lists of what's found in Texas would draw on the mu museum records, some of which we know are erroneous. And so we, we did was just go to taxonomic literature and look for records of where the species was described and all the places where it was listed to occur. So we could get um, literature records that were not reflected already in the museum records, some, some portion of which were incorrect. Okay, so then we took those museum and literature records and used them to guide our vegetative community sampling. And what we wanted to do was sample in places that had been overlooked by those past uh, efforts. We wanted also to, like we couldn't just um, walk across Texas and take a sample every meter, um, obviously. So we needed to focus our efforts somewhat. So our strategy, was to sample in places that hadn't already been historically sampled that much and sample the most likely places. We know from other, other broad patterns of snail diversity that uh, forested bedrock uh, limestone areas really probably have a lot of snails and uh, moonscape badlands probably don't have that many. So we folk narrowed down to the vegetative communities that were most likely to be diverse in snails. And then we also emphasized the edges of Texas. So what we did was we looked for species where we know they're, they're reported in Louisiana and Arkansas in disjunct habitats where we have a little patch of that habitat in Texas. And so we would go target that habitat to try and get species that likely extended into Texas but hadn't been reported yet. And then the last step was we went to each of the sites where those uh, 30 SGCN taxa had been reported and tried to see if they were still there. Okay, so we use a standardized sampling effort for commu snail communities. You kind of map out your patch of habitat. You go around sampling leaf litter at all of the likely habitat spots, uh, microhabitats for snails, and put all of that leaf litter material or grass turf material through a set of stacking sieves. Uh, you pull all the snails off the top sieve, which is about two millimeter mesh, and your lower sieve, 0.65, should catch any of the snails that are there. And you keep collecting leaf litter, keep putting material through your sieve until you have seen about 300 um, snails on the two sieves combined. So you get to about 300, you probably have way more than that, but that's what you've seen. And then you say, okay, we're done sampling this patch. Now, then you take everything that's retained in the sieves, you bring it to the lab, you wash it, uh, sieve it again to get rid of extra bulk, extra soil, wash off some of the snails. You dry it, laid out on newspaper, and then you sieve it again and pick them. So you put them under the microscope, spoonful, teaspoonful by teaspoonful, and pick them, and then sort and identify. So here's a pretty typical uh, sample of land snails sorted out to species, counted and ID'd. We did those initial counts and IDs. And then the whole group got back together for another quality control step and re-identified everything that we had collected so that we met the same identification standard as we applied to the museum work.
So we ended up uh, taking a little bit over 200 new field collections. This was two samples per vegetative community. And if we could, we tried to get those vegetative communities as far apart as we could have access to them. Um, so here's where we mostly took our samples. And as you can see, we did not equally cover all parts of Texas. We were trying to cover the parts most likely to have a lot of snails and also hadn't been uh, hugely sampled. Okay, so our final data set was 8,558 records, over 200,000 individual snails, um, mostly, largely from museum, literature, and new survey. And so this is our now our database. This is the evidence that we're gonna use for establishing conservation status rankings for the land snails. And so we use this database of uh, records where a snail has been found to calculate the extent of their range. So this little picture, this little picture shows a range extent map uh, for some species that's only found on three mountaintops. We use the number of known populations for each taxon. So we look at our records for each species. You know, if this species is listed, it's been found 20 times in Landa Park and New Braunfels, we just count that once. So we count all the non-duplicate known populations for each species. And then we use that information along with a threat assessment for different regions of Texas and put that into this ranking calculator that NatureServe uses to standardize the conservation status ranks. So we take the range that they, they occupy, the number of occurrences and a threat estimate. And this little ranking calculator spreadsheet kicks out a estimated conservation status rank. And then we take that and we discuss it and require again, two person agreement by myself and Jeff Nicola and document every step of the way. So sometimes, for example, a species would pop up that is only found in, you know, like two or three different Taylor slopes in the Guadalupe uh, mountains, but its entire range is in the federal park. And so that might pop out as a G1, highly imperiled because it has very few populations in a very small range, but its entire range is in a very protected area. And so we would consider that less imperiled than something that's only found in one spot on you know, the outskirts of San Antonio where it's under extreme threat of development. So we would modify the ranks documenting that as we go, depending on the um, calculated imperilment status and that's then also adding other information to modify those if needed. Okay, last thing we did was make our three data sets comparable so we could understand and test whether literature, um, museum records or new collections were most useful for encountering snails and also those rare species. So let me tell you a little bit about what we found. Uh, so we drastically revised our understanding of the Texas land snail fauna. So we went from initially 254 land snails that had been recorded were listed somewhere as occurring in the state down to 198 species that we have solid evidence. We've seen the, the shells uh, to confirm. We went from 30 species of greatest conservation need to 67. This is not just adding species. A lot of species that were on the list got removed. So there was about 80% turnover in that SGCN list. So a lot of the species that require conservation attention in Texas were not being considered. And there was some that may already have been considered that really are not as highly imperiled. And then we found quite a few new records of introduced species. Just as a fun fact, uh, Gastrocopta pellucida, this is called the slim snaggletooth, and it's one of the very tiny ones. Um, it was the most abundant snail we found. So three out of every four snails that we looked at out of 200,000 snails in Texas was this species, was Gastrocopta pellucida. They're just everywhere. Now, one thing that gives us some confidence that this new list of species of greatest conservation need better reflects real imperilment status and Texas diversity is that now the minute snails, as an example, they're 30, they were 36% of the fauna in our Texas sample. They used to be none on the SGCN list, and now the uh, their 34 percent of the list is made up of this minute size class. And here's two examples of snails that would fit into this minute class. Um, and so now they more accurately ref reflect the fauna. Now we had a really dramatic revision of the rankings of the species about. 82% of the species changed rank or status. Now, a big chunk of this was taxa 
that had been documented in the state before, but they weren't ranked previously. So that's a big chunk of it. But we also had 15 species that were less imperiled than we had thought before. So that might be something that we were considered imperiled, but now we have moved that all the way over to vulnerable or really pretty stable. And then we had three species that are more imperiled than previously understood. And a big chunk of species that are just unrankable because their taxonomic status is so uncertain. We have 13 species that were removed from the, the state list of species completely. And these were mostly due to um, museum misidentifications where something had been reported from the state, but it actually does not occur here. or We couldn't find any evidence for it. It was just a misID. And so what we found 82% of species changed ranks is that when you really apply solid evidence to a ranking effort, you get something very different than what you get from just a purview of, you know, review of the literature. And so conservation status ranks that are not based on solid evidence can be more wrong than right and really are not an effective tool for prioritizing conservation efforts. Okay, and so that one question that we wanted to ask, what's the best approach for sampling a poorly known group across a large landscape? It's very tempting for a natural resource manager to want to you know, get someone to pull down a bunch of museum data and use that to figure out these conservation status ranks. Um, but which of these approaches, and it, but it's more expensive to pay someone to spend three years tromping around Texas and really do a complete analysis. But which of these is more effective? So what we found is when we do a comparison of these three methods, this graph on the left is all the species. The one on the right is just the rare. This bottom dotted line is performance of literature in um, accumulating species richness. The museum records are the 95% confidence interval, and then field collections are the solid bar. So what we found is that for both all species diversity and rare species, new field collections outperform museum and literature in generating species observations. So if you want new state records, you have to go and use targeted strategic sampling, probably at the edges of ranges of things, in order to get the most new state records. The most bang for your buck is new collections. So of our new state records, I think there was 34, 32% were the result of finding them in museums where they'd been misidentified and overlooked, and 55% were field collections. One of the reasons we think this happened, and we documented this well in a, a study of the museum records, is that these literature and museum records are really biased towards the large species. The snail that's really big, 40 millimeters, or even moderately big, uh, those are easier to collect, more people focus on them. And so those ten types of records tended to be, to be biased for those species. If you are going out and using a targeted sampling method that's appropriate for your specific fauna that you're trying to work up, work on and collect evidence for, then you're more likely to really accurately capture the whole pool of diversity. Okay, so just in case you think that we now know a lot of Texas land snails, uh, these two maps on the left is the number of samples in our database by county. And on the right is the number of snail species documented so far by county. The white uh, counties have zero records or species recorded. Uh, the light gray is one through four, and then greater than 20 are the black. And so what you can see is there's more than 50 Texas counties that have no records in our database, and then apparently no snail species recorded. Um, and then there's a huge chunk in gray that only have one site. So think about your county and how many different natural areas and habitats and places you might see snails, one sample is not really adequate to represent any of those uh, counties. So clearly we have a lot to learn. If you if you just like glance at these two, you see that they kind of show similar color patterns, telling us that what we think about the species richness in Texas is largely driven just still by where people have sampled, not really a complete picture of the diversity of the state. So there's still uh, plenty to learn. Okay, I wanted to wrap up with just a couple of highlights of things that we that we saw. Um, so one of the most interesting places that we visited and sampled was the Sabal Palm Sanctuary. This is run by the Gorgas Foundation in Brownsville. And in that, that palm sanctuary, you have the only remaining uh, old growth, never logged Sabal Palm forest in a very small patch. And that site, we found the only remaining Texas locality for Strobelops Hubbard 
or die. Uh, Sable palm used to extend all the way up the coast and was logged extensively for building docks and things like that. And um, it no longer occurs in where it was originally described from, but we did find it there living very abundantly just in that like less than 10 acre patch of Sable palm. And then we found the first collection of living Gastrocopto, Gastrocopta Rio Grandensis. This was described from uh, River Rio Grande River Drift in New Mexico and Texas, um, but had never been seen alive. And we found them living on um, some of the floodplain area near the Sabal Palms in the Sabal Palm Sanctuary. I told you we had quite a few state records. We had 30, something like 34 state records, including two new records for a genera that are new to the state. Uh, Celostema pergonasta, that's this guy on the left. They're huge, they're like this big. This is one that had been collected 50 years ago, but was misidentified as one of the local Texas holospiras, and it's actually a Celostema. And then this one on the right, this is a species of Celasiella. Um, you're probably familiar with Euglandina uh, singliana or Euglandina rosea, the rosy wolf snail or the Texas wolf snail. So these are relatively big carnivorous snails that occur uh, in many parts of Texas. Um, this is another member of that same family and it's um, they are also carnivores, but they're only known from Central and maybe a few get as far as Monterey in northern Mexico, but we found a population at uh, Independence Creek in West Texas. So we found a lot of neat stuff and got to visit lots of cool places. And I'd say my take home message is there's still a lot to learn about our Texas land snails. And if you really want to know uh, to get a good um, data set underlying your conservation status ranks, um, it's necessary to critically evaluate those those conservation status ranks and build that data set, including new field collections, in order to really have the um, an accurate depiction of what needs conserving in the state's fauna. So with that, I am happy to spend some time talking about snails and take any questions that you have.